Part Three, Chapter Sixteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. The Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Kutuzov, accompanied by his aides, rode slowly after the carabiners. After riding half a verst, he caught up with the rear end of the column and halted at a single deserted house. It had apparently been a drinking house near the junction of two roads. Both roads led down into the valley, and both were crowded with troops. The fog began to disperse, and already two versts away could be seen, though as yet indistinctly, the ranks of the enemy on the heights opposite. Down in the valley at the left, the firing was growing more violent. Kutuzov halted, discussing some point with the Austrian general. Prince Andrei, sitting on his horse a little distance behind, gazed at them, and then, wishing to obtain the use of a field-glass, turned to one of the aides who had one. "'Look! Look!' exclaimed this adjutant, turning his glass not at the distant host, but to a hill nearby in front of them. "'Look! There are the French!' The two generals and the adjutants reached after the glass, one taking it from the other. All the faces suddenly changed, and an expression of dismay came into them. They expected to find the French two versts away, and there they were unexpectedly appearing right at hand. Is that the enemy? It can't be. Yes, look, they. Certainly it is. What does it mean? exclaimed various voices. Prince Andrei, with his naked eye, could see a dense mass of the French moving up at the right to meet the Esferian boys, not more than five hundred paces from the very spot where Kutuzov was standing. Here it is. The decisive moment is at hand. My chance has come, said Prince Andrei, and starting up his horse he approached Kutuzov. The Asphirin men ought to be halted, your eminence, he cried. But at that very instant all became veiled in smoke. The rattle of musketry sounded near them, and a naively terrified voice only two steps from Prince Andrei called, Well, brothers, it's all up with us. And this voice seemed to be a command. At this voice all started to run. Confused, but still constantly increasing throngs ran back by the very same place where five minutes before the troops had filed so proudly past the emperors. Not only was it hard to arrest these fugitives, but it was even impossible not to be borne back by the mob. Balkonsky could only struggle not to let them pass him, and he gazed around finding it quite out of the question to understand what was taking place at the front. Nezvitsky, with angry face, flushed and quite unlike himself, cried to Kutuzov that if he did not instantly come away, he would probably be taken prisoner. Kutuzov still stayed in the same place and without answering took out his handkerchief. A stream of blood was trickling from his face. Prince Andrei forced his way through to where he was. "'You are wounded?' he asked, scarcely controlling the trembling of his lower jaw. "'The wound is not here, but yonder,' said Kutuzov, pressing his handkerchief to his wounded cheek and pointing to the fugitives. "'Halt them!' he cried, and at the same time, evidently convinced that it was an impossibility to bring them to a halt, he gave spurs to his horse and rode off to the right." New masses of fugitives came pouring along like a torrent, engulfed him, and bore him along with them. These troops were pouring back in such a dense throng that when one was once entangled in the midst of it, there was great difficulty in extricating oneself. Some shouted, He's coming! Why don't you let him pass? Others turned around and fired their muskets into the air. Others struck the horse on which Kutuzov rode, but by the exercise of supreme force, Kutuzov, accompanied by his staff, diminished by more than half, struggled through to the left and rode off in the direction of the cannonading herd not far away. Prince Andrei, also forcing his way through the throng of fugitives, and endeavoring not to become separated from Kutuzov, could make out through the reek of gunpowder smoke a Russian battery on the side of the hill still blazing away vigorously while the French were just marching against it. A little higher up stood the Russian infantry, neither moving forward to the aid of the battery, nor back in the same direction with the fugitives. A general spurred down from this brigade of infantry and approached Kutuzov. Out of Kutuzov's staff only four men were left, and all were pale and silently exchanged glances. "'Stop those poltroons!' cried Kutuzov, all out of breath, as the regimental commander came up to him and pointing to the fugitives. But at that very second, as though for punishment for those words— like a bevy of birds, a number of bullets flew buzzing over the heads of the regiment and of Kutuzov's staff. 
The French were charging the battery, and when they caught sight of Kutuzov, they aimed at him. At this volley, the regimental commander suddenly clapped his hand to his leg. A few soldiers fell, and an ensign standing with the flag dropped it from his hand. The flag reeled and fell, catching on the bayonets of the soldiers near him. The men began to load and fire without orders. Oh, groaned Kutuzov, with an expression of despair, and glanced around. Bolkonsky, he whispered, his weak old man's voice trembling with emotion. Belkonsky, he whispered, pointing to the demoralized battalion and at the enemy. What does this mean? But before he had uttered these words, Prince Andrei, conscious of the tears of shame and anger choking him, had already leaped from his horse and rushed toward the standard. Children, follow me, he cried in his youthful, penetrating voice. Here it is, thought Prince Andrei, as he seized the flagstaff, and he listened with rapture to the whiz of the bullets that were evidently directed straight at him. A number of the soldiers fell. Hurrah! cried Prince Andrei, instantly seizing the flag and rushing forward with unfailing confidence that the whole battalion would follow him. In fact, he ran on only a few steps alone. Then one soldier was stirred, and then another, and the whole battalion with huzzas dashed forward and overtook him. A non-commissioned officer of the battalion grasped the standard, which from its weight shook in Prince Andrei's hand, but he was instantly shot down. Prince Andrei again grasped the flag and, dragging it along by the staff, followed after the battalion. In front of him he saw our artillerymen, some fighting, others abandoning the guns and running toward him. He also saw the French infantry, who had seized the artillery horses and were reversing the field pieces. Prince Andrei and the battalion were now only twenty paces distant from the battery. He heard the incessant whizzing of the bullets over his head and the soldiers constantly groaning and falling at his left and at his right. But he did not look at them. His eyes were fastened only on what was going on in front of him, where the battery was. He now saw distinctly a red-headed artilleryman, with his shako knocked in and on one side, struggling with a French soldier for the possession of the ramrod. Prince André distinguished clearly the distorted and angry faces of these two men, who evidently were not aware of what they were doing. "'What are they up to?' queried Prince André, as he looked at them. Why doesn't the sandy artillerist run if he has no weapons, and why doesn't the Frenchman finish him? He wouldn't have time to get any distance, though, before the Frenchman would recollect his musket and put an end to him. In point of fact, another Frenchman, with pointed bayonet, ran up to the combatants, and the fate of the red-haired artillerist, who had no idea what was coming upon him, and had just triumphantly made himself master of the ramrod, must have been sealed. But Prince André did not witness the end of the struggle. It seemed to him as though one of the approaching soldiers struck him in the head with the full weight of a cudgel. It was rather painful, but his chief sensation was that of displeasure because it distracted his attention and prevented him from seeing what he had been looking at. What does this mean? Am I falling? Surely my legs are giving way, he said to himself, and he fell on his back. He opened his eyes, hoping to see how the struggle between the artillerymen and the Frenchmen ended, and anxious to know whether or not the red-haired artillerist was killed or not, and the cannon saved or captured. But he could see nothing of it. Over him he could see nothing except the sky, the lofty sky, no longer clear, but still immeasurably lofty, and with light gray clouds slowly wandering over it. How still, calm, and solemn! How entirely different from when I was running, said Prince Andrei to himself. It was not so when we were all running and shouting and fighting. How entirely different it is from when the Frenchmen and the artillerymen, with vindictive and frightened faces, were struggling for possession of the ramrod. It wasn't so that the clouds then floated over the infinite depths of sky. How is it that I never before saw this lofty sky? And how glad I am that I have learned to know it at last. Yes, all is empty, all is deception, except these infinite heavens. Nothing, nothing at all, beside. And even that is nothing but silence and peace. And thank God. End of chapter 16。Part 3, Chapter 17 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne.
At nine o'clock, the right wing, under Bagration, had not as yet begun to fight. Unwilling to acquiesce in Dolgorukov's urgency to begin the battle, and anxious to escape the responsibility, Prince Bagration proposed to the latter to send and make inquiries of the commander-in-chief. Bagration knew that as the distance separating the two wings was almost ten versts, the messenger, if he were not killed, which was very probable, and even if he found the commander-in-chief, which would be extremely difficult, would not have time to return till late in the afternoon. Bagration glanced over his staff, with his great, expressionless, sleepy eyes, and was involuntarily attracted by Rostov's boyish face, full of excitement and hope. He chose him for the messenger. "'And if I should meet His Majesty first, before I found the Commander-in-Chief, Your Illustriousness?' asked Rostov, touching his cap visor. "'You can give the message to His Majesty,' said Dolgorukov, taking the words out of Bagration's mouth. After he was relieved at the outposts, Rostov had been able to catch a few hours' sleep before the morning, and felt happy, full of daring and resolution, and brimming over with elasticity of motion and confidence in his own good fortune. In such a state of mind, everything seems easy, bright, and possible. All his desires had been fulfilled that morning. A general engagement was to be fought. He was to take part in it. Moreover, he had been made orderly on the staff of one of the bravest generals. Nay, more, he was entrusted with a message to Kutuzov, and might have to deliver it to the sovereign himself. The morning was clear and bright. The horse that he rode was excellent. His heart was full of joy and courage. Having received his instructions, he struck in the spurs and galloped off along the line. At first he passed in front of Bagration's forces, which had not as yet engaged, and were ranged in motionless ranks. Then he rode into the space occupied by Uvarov's cavalry, and here he began to remark some excitement and indications of readiness for battle. After passing Uvarov's cavalry, he began to distinguish clearly the sounds of cannonading and musketry in front of him. The firing kept growing more violent. The morning air was fresh and clear, and it was no longer firing at irregular intervals, two or three shots at a time, and then one or two cannon shot. But along the declivities of the hills in front of Pratzen was heard the thunder of musketry, dominated by such frequent reports from the heavy guns that often a number of them could not be distinguished apart, but mingled in one general rumble. It could be seen how over the mountainside, the puffs of smoke from the muskets seemed to run along, chasing each other, and how the great clouds of smoke from the cannon rolled whirling up, spread and mingled in the air. By the glint of bayonets through the smoke, the masses of infantry could be seen moving along, and the narrow ribbons of artillery, with their green caissons. Rostov reined in his horse on a hilltop for a moment, in order to watch what was going on, but in spite of the closeness of his scrutiny, he could not make out or decipher himself from what he saw, what men were moving in the smoke, or what bodies of troops were hurrying this way and that, back and forth. But why? Who are they? Where are they going? It was impossible to tell. This spectacle did not arouse in him any melancholy or timid feelings. On the contrary, they filled him with a new energy and zeal. Well, then, give it to them again, said he, mentally replying to these sounds. And again he started on a gallop along the lines, making his way farther and farther within the domain of troops already now entering into the action. How this is going to turn out yonder I do not know, but it will be all right, thought Rostov. Having passed by some of the troops of the Austrian army, Rostov noticed that the portion of the line next, they were the guards, were already moving to the attack. So much the better, I can see it close at hand, he said to himself. He was now riding along almost at the very front. A number of horsemen were galloping in his direction. These were our Lieb Uhlans, who, with broken and disorderly ranks, were returning from the charge. Rostov passed them and could not help noticing that one of them was covered with blood, but he galloped on. That's of no consequence to me, he said to himself. He had ridden only a few hundred paces further when he perceived at his left, coming down upon him, an immense body of cavalry extending the whole length of the field and likely to cross his path. They were on coal-black horses and dressed in brilliant white uniforms. Rostov spurred his horse at full speed so as to get out of the way of these cavalrymen, and he would easily have done so had they kept on at the same pace all the time, but they rode faster and faster, and some of the horses were almost upon him. Rostov distinguished more and more clearly the trampling of their feet and the jingling of their arms, 
and could see more and more distinctly their horses, their figures, and their faces. These were our cavalier guards, on their way to charge the French cavalry, who were deploying to meet them. The cavalier guards came galloping along, still keeping their horses under restraint. Rostov could already see their faces and hear the word of command spoken by an officer. Marsh! Marsh! Who was urging on his blooded charger. Rostov, afraid of being crushed or carried away into the charge against the French, spurred along the front with all the speed that he could get out of his horse, and still it seemed as though he were going to fail of it. The last rider in the line, a pockmarked man of giant frame, frowned angrily when he saw Rostov in front of him, knowing that they must infallibly come into collision. This guardsman would surely have overthrown Rostov, for Rostov himself could not help seeing how small and slight he and Bedouin were, in comparison with these tremendous men and horses, if he had not had the presence of mind to shake his riding whip into the eyes of the guardsman's horse. The charger, black as coal, heavy and high, shied, cropping back his ears, but the pock-marked rider plunged his huge spurs into his side with all his might, and the charger, arching his tail and stretching out his neck, rushed onwards faster than ever. Rostov was hardly out of the way of the guardsmen when he heard their huzzas, and glancing around saw that their front ranks were already mingling with strange horsemen with red epaulets, apparently the French. Farther away it was impossible to see anything, because immediately after this on the other side the cannon began to belch forth smoke, and everything was shrouded. At the moment that the guardsmen dashed past him and were lost to view in the smoke, Rostov was undecided in his own mind whether he should gallop after them or go where his duty called him. This was that brilliant charge of the cavalier guards, which the French themselves so much admired. It was terrible for Rostov when he heard afterward that out of all that throng of handsome young giants, out of all those brilliant rich young men, officers and yunkers mounted on splendid chargers who galloped past him, only eighteen were left alive after the charge. Why should I envy them? My turn will come, and perhaps I shall see the sovereign very soon now, thought Rostov, as he galloped on. When he came up to the infantry of the guards, his attention was called to the fact that shot and shell were flying over them and all around them, not so much because he heard the sounds of the missiles as because he saw dismay on the faces of the soldiers and an unnatural martial solemnity on the faces of the officers. As he was riding behind one of the infantry regiments of the guard, he heard a voice calling him by name. Rostov! What is it? he replied, not seeing that it was Boris. What do you think of this? We were put in the front line. Our regiment has been in a charge, said Boris, smiling with the happy face such as young men wear when they have been for the first time under fire. Rostov drew up. Have you indeed? he said. And how was it? Repulsed, said Boris eagerly, and becoming talkative. You can imagine. And Boris began to relate how the guards, as they stood in their places and seeing troops in front of them, mistook them for Austrians, and then suddenly by the shots that came flying over them from these same troops, recognized that they were in the front line and unexpectedly engaged in the conflict. Rostov, not stopping to hear Boris to the end of the story, started his horse. "'Where are you bound?' "'To his majesty, with a message.' "'There he is,' said Boris, who supposed that Rostov wanted his highness instead of his majesty, and therefore pointed him to the Grand Duke, who was standing not a hundred paces away. Dressed in a helmet and a cavalier guard collet or jacket, with elevated shoulders and frowning face, he was shouting something to a pale Austrian officer in a white uniform. "'No, that's the Grand Duke, but my errand is to the Commander-in-Chief, or to the Emperor,' said Rostov, and was just getting his horse under way. "'Count! Count!' cried Berg, who, no less excited than Boris had been, came running out from the other side. "'Count, I have been wounded in my right arm,' said he, pointing to his wrist, which was bloody and wrapped up in a handkerchief, and I stayed at the front. "'Count, I had to hold my sword in my left hand. In our family all the von Bergs have been knighted.' Berg went on to say something more, but Rostov, not stopping to listen to him, was already far away. Passing by the guards and across a vacant space, Rostov, in order not to get into the front again, as he had been when he was caught by the charge of the cavalier guards, rode along the line of the reserves, making a considerable detour of the place where the most violent cannonade and musketry firing was heard. Suddenly he heard loud volleys of musketry before him, and behind our troops, in a place where he would never have suspected the presence of the enemy, 
"'What can that mean?' wondered Rostov. "'Can the enemy have outflanked us?' "'It cannot be,' he said to himself, and a horror of fear for himself and for the success of the battle suddenly came over him. "'Whatever it is, however,' he thought, "'now there's no avoiding it. I must find the commander-in-chief here, and if all is lost, then it is my place to perish with the rest.' The gloomy presentiment which had come over him was more and more made certainty the farther he rode into the fields behind the village of Pratzen, which were occupied by throngs of demoralized troops. What does this mean? What can this mean? At whom are they firing? Who is firing? he inquired, as he overtook Russian and Austrian soldiers running in confused throngs across his path. The devil only knows. He has beaten us all. All is lost, answered the throngs of the fugitives in Russian in German, and in Bohemian, and they could tell no better than he himself could what was going on there. "'Hang the Germans!' cried one. "'The devil take em, the traitors!' "'Zum Henker dieser Russen! To the devil with these Russians!' stammered some German. A number of wounded were wandering down the road. Curses, cries, groans, mingled in one general uproar. The firing ceased. As Rostov afterwards heard, Russian and Austrian soldiers had fired at each other. Bouzmoi, my God, what does this mean? thought Rostov. And here, where any minute the emperor might see them. But no, these were apparently only a few cowards. This is only transient. This is nothing. It cannot be, he said to himself. I must get by them as soon as possible. The idea of a defeat, and of a total defeat, could not enter Rostov's head. Although he could see the French cannon and troops on the Pratzer, on the very place where he had been commanded to find the commander-in-chief, he could not and would not believe this. End of chapter 17。Part 3 Chapter 18 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Rostov had been told that he should find Kutuzov and the emperor somewhere in the vicinity of the village of Pratzen. But they were not to be found there, nor was a single Nachalnik in sight, but everywhere throngs of fleeing troops of all nationalities. He spurred on his horse, which was already growing fagged, so as to pass by these fugitives as quickly as possible, but the farther he went, the more demoralized he found the forces. Along the high roads where he was riding, Carriages and equipages of all sorts were crowded together. Russian and Austrian soldiers of all the different branches of the service. Wounded and not wounded. All this mass hummed and confusedly swarmed under the dispiriting sounds of the shells fired from French batteries posted on the heights overlooking Pratzen. "'Where is the emperor? Where is Kutuzov?' asked Rostov of all whom he could bring to a stop, but not one could vouchsafe him any answer." At last seizing a soldier by the collar, he obliged him to reply. "'Eh, hey, brother, they've all been yonder this long time, all cut sticks,' said the soldier laughing for some reason, and breaking away. Releasing the soldier, who was evidently drunk, Rostov managed to stop the denschik, or the groom, of some person of consequence, and began to ply him with questions. The denschik told Rostov that the emperor had been driven by an hour before at full speed, in a carriage along this same road, and that the emperor had been wounded. "'It cannot be,' said Rostov. "'It must have been someone else.' "'I myself saw him,' said the Denschik, with a self-satisfied laugh. "'I ought to know the sovereign by sight. I should like to know how many times I have seen him in Petersburg. He leaned back in the carriage and was pale, very pale. "'Heavens! What a rate those four black horses thundered by us here! I should think I might know the Tsar's horses, and Ilya Ivanuitch. I guess Ilya, the coachman, wouldn't be very likely to drive by with anyone less than the Tsar. Rostov gave his horse the spur and started to ride farther. A wounded officer passing by turned to him. Who was it you wanted? asked the officer. The commander-in-chief. He was killed by a cannonball, hit him in the chest, right at the head of our regiment. Not killed, only wounded, said another officer. Who? Kutuzov? asked Rostov. No, not Kutuzov, but what do you call him? Ah, well, it's all the same. Not many are left alive. If you go down yonder, yonder to that village, 
you'll find all the commanders gathered, said the officer, pointing to the village of Gostiradek, and he passed on. Rostov walked his horse, not knowing now where to go or whom to seek. The sovereign wounded, the battle lost. It was impossible to believe that, even now. Rostov rode away in the direction indicated by the officer. In the distance could be seen towers and a church. What was the need of him to hurry? What had he now to say to the sovereign or to Kutuzov, even if they were alive and not wounded? That road, take that road, your nobility, else they'll shoot you down yonder, cried a soldier to him. They'll shoot you. Oh, what are you talking about, cried another. That's the nearest way to where he's going. Rostov considered a moment, and then rode in exactly the direction where they said that he would be killed. Now it's all the same to me. If the sovereign is wounded, why should I try to save my life? he asked himself. He rode out on the open space where there had been the heaviest slaughter of men escaping from Pratzen. The French had not yet occupied this place, and the Russians, that is, those who were alive or only slightly wounded, had long before abandoned it. On the ground, like shocks of corn on a fertile field, lay ten men, fifteen men, killed or wounded, on every root of the place. The wounded had crawled together, two or three at a time, and their cries and groans could be heard most gruesomely, though it seemed to Rostov that they were often simulated. He put his horse at a trot, so as not to see all these suffering men, and a great horror overcame him. He was not afraid for his own life, but lest he should lose the manliness which he felt was essential to him. He knew that he could not endure the spectacle of those unfortunate wretches. The French had ceased to fire on this field strewn with dead and wounded, because there was no longer any sign of life on it. But when they caught sight of the adjutant riding across, they turned one of their cannon on it and sent a few balls after him. The sensation caused by these terrific whistling sounds, and the spectacle of the dead around him, aroused in Rostov's mind an impression of horror and self-commiseration. He recalled his mother's last letter. How would she feel, he asked himself, if she should see me now, here in this field, with these cannon pointed at me? At the village of Gostiradek, the Russian troops were retiring from the field of battle in good order, though the regiments were mixed together. This was out of range of the French cannonballs, and the sounds of the firing seemed more distant. Here all clearly saw and openly confessed that the battle was lost. No one to whom Rostov applied for information could tell him where the emperor was or where Kutuzov was. Some declared that the report about the sovereign being wounded was correct. Others denied it and explained this false though widespread rumor by the fact that the Oberhofmarschall, Count Tolstoy, who had gone out in company of others of the suite to see the battle, had dashed away pale and frightened from the field of battle in the emperor's carriage. One officer told Rostov that in the rear of the village over toward the left he had seen some officials of high rank, and Rostov started in that direction, not indeed with the expectation of finding anyone, but merely for the sake of clearing his conscience. After riding three versts and passing beyond the last of the Russian troops, Rostov reached an orchard protected by a ditch and saw two riders standing near the ditch. One with a white plume in his hat had a familiar look. The other rider, whom he did not know, was mounted on a handsome chestnut charger. This charger somehow seemed familiar to Rostov, and rode up to the ditch, put spurs to his horse, and giving him his head, easily leaped the ditch into the orchard. The earth merely crumbled away a little from the embankment under the horse's hind hoofs. Turning his horse short, he leaped back over the ditch again, and addressed himself respectfully to the rider with the white plume, apparently urging him to do the same thing. The rider whose figure Rostov seemed to recognize, and had therefore involuntarily attracted his attention, shook his head and made a gesture of refusal with his hand, and Rostov immediately by this gesture knew that it was his idolized, lamented sovereign. But it cannot be that he is left alone in this bare field, thought Rostov. Just then Alexander turned his head so that he had a good view of those beloved features so sharply graven in his memory. The sovereign was pale his cheeks sunken, and his eyes cavernous, but there was all the more charm, all the more sweetness in his features. Rostov was delighted to be convinced that the rumor of the sovereign's wound was false. He was happy to have seen him. He knew that he might, nay, that he ought, go straight up to him and deliver the message that had been entrusted to him by Dolgorokov, 
but just as a young man in love trembles and loses his presence of mind, not daring to say what he has been dreaming about night after night, and timidly looks around, in search of help or the possibility of postponing it, when the wished-for moment has at last arrived, and he stands alone with her. So also with Rostov, now that he had attained what he had yearned for more than all else in the world, he did not know how to approach his sovereign, and devised a thousand excuses for finding it untimely, improper, and impossible. What? I might seem to be taking advantage of his being alone and dejected. An unknown face at this moment of sorrow might seem unpleasant and troublesome. Besides, what could I say to him now, when one glance from him makes my heart swell within me and seem to leap into my mouth? Not one of those innumerable speeches which he had so carefully prepared in case he should meet the emperor now recurred to his mind. Those speeches were for the most part indicated under different conditions. They were to be spoken at the moment of victory and triumph. Above all, on his deathbed, when he sank under the wounds that he had received, his sovereign would come to see him and thank him for his heroic conduct. Thus he would show him his love sealed by his death. Besides, what now could I ask the emperor in regard to his commands to the left wing, when now already it is four o'clock in the afternoon, and the battle is lost? No, really I ought not to trouble him. I ought not to break in upon his reflections. It would be better to die a thousand times than to receive an angry look or an angry word from him. Such was Rostov's decision, and melancholy, and with despair in his heart he rode away, constantly glancing back at the emperor, still remaining in the same undecided attitude. While Rostov was making these reflections and sadly rode away from his sovereign, Captain von Toll galloped up to the same place, and seeing the emperor went straight up to him, offered him his services, and helped him to cross the ditch on foot. The emperor, wishing to rest and feeling ill, sat down under an apple tree, and Toll stood near him. Rostov looked from afar, and saw with jealousy and regret how von Toll talked long and eagerly to the sovereign, and how the sovereign, apparently weeping, covered his eyes with one hand, and with the other pressed von Toll's. And I might have done that in his place, thought Rostov, and with difficulty restraining the tears of sympathy for his sovereign, he rode away in utter despair, not knowing now where he should go or for what reason. His despair was all the more bitter, because he felt that his own weakness was the cause of his misfortune. He might, not only might, but he ought to have ridden up to the emperor. And this was his only chance of exhibiting to the sovereign his devotion, and he did not take advantage of it. Why did I do so? he asked himself, and he turned his horse about, and galloped back to the same place where the emperor had been sitting, but there was no one any longer on the other side of the ditch. A train of baggage wagons and carriages was winding along. From one of the wagoneers, Rostov learned that Kutuzov's staff were not very far away, at the village where the wagons were bound. Rostov followed them. The foremost in the train, Kutuzov's groom, leading a horse with his trappings, the wagons followed behind the groom, and behind the wagon walked an old man, a household serf with bandy legs, wearing a cap and a half shuba. Tit! Ah, tit! cried the groom. What is it? asked the old man heedlessly. Tit! Tit! Grind the wheat! Eh! Durak! T! said the old man, angrily spitting. Some time passed in silence as they moved onward, and then the same joking rhyme was repeated. By five o'clock in the evening the battle was lost at every point. More than a hundred cannon had already fallen into the hands of the French. Prashevsky and his battalion had laid down their arms. The other columns, having lost more than half their efficient, were retreating in disorderly, demoralized throngs. The relics of Langeron and Dukhtorov's forces, all in confusion, were crowded together around the ponds, on the dikes and banks of the village of August. By six o'clock the only cannonading that was any longer heard was directed at the dike of August by some of the French, who had established a large battery on the slopes of the Prezer, and were trying to cut down our men as they retreated. At the rear, Dokhtorov and some others, having collected their battalions, made a stand against the French, who were pursuing our troops. It had begun to be entirely dark. On the narrow dike of August, where so many years the little old miller had peacefully sat with his hook and line, while his grandson, with shirt-sleeves rolled up, played in the water-can with a palpitating silver fish, 
on that dyke over which the Moravians, in shaggy caps and blue blouses, had driven their two horse teams loaded down with spring wheat, and returned dusted with flour and with whitened teams. Along this same dyke, this narrow dyke, among vans and field pieces, under the feet of horses and between the wheels, crowded a throng of men, their faces distorted with fear of death, pushing each other, expiring, trampling on the dying and dead, and crushing each other, only to be killed themselves a few steps farther on. Every ten seconds a cannonball, compressing the air, flew by, or a shell came bursting amid this dense throng, dealing death and spattering with blood those who stood nearby. Dolokhov, wounded in the arm, on foot with ten men of his company, he was now an officer again, and his regimental commander, on horseback, constituted the sole survivors of the whole regiment. Carried along in the throng, they were crowded together at the very entrance of the dike, and pressed on all sides, were obliged to halt, because a horse attached to a field piece had fallen, and the throng were trying to drag it along. One cannonball struck someone behind them, another struck just in front, and spattered Dolokhov with blood. The crowd moved on in desperation, squeezing together, and then halted again. If only we could make those hundred paces, and safety is sure. If we stay here two minutes longer, our destruction is certain, said each one to himself. Dolokhov, standing in the midst of the throng, forced his way through to the edge of the dike, knocking down two soldiers, and sprang out on the glare ice that covered the pond. Turn out this way, he cried, sliding along on the ice, which bent under his weight. Turn out, he cried to the gunner. It will hold, it will hold. And it was evident that it would immediately give way, if not under his weight alone, certainly under that of the field piece or the throng of men. They looked at him and crowded along the shore, not venturing to step upon the ice. The commander of the regiment, sitting on horseback at the entrance, was just raising his hand and opening his mouth to speak to Dolokhov, when suddenly a cannonball flew so close over the men that they all ducked their heads. There was a dull thud as though something soft were struck, and the general fell in a pool of blood. No one looked at the general or thought of picking him up. Come on the ice. Cross the ice. Come on. Move on, don't you hear? Come was heard suddenly from innumerable voices after the cannonball had struck the general, though the men knew not what or why they were crying. One of the last field pieces that was just entering the dike ventured on the ice. A throng of soldiers hastened down from the ground upon the frozen pond. One of the rearmost soldiers broke through, one leg slumping down into the water. He tried to save himself and sank up to his belt. The men who stood nearest held back. The driver of the field piece drew in his horses, but still behind them were heard the shouts, Take to the ice! What are you stopping for? Take to the ice! Take to the ice! And cries of horror were heard among the throng. The soldiers surrounding the gun gesticulated over their horses and beat them to make them turn and go on. The horses struck out from the shore. The ice, which might have held the foot soldiers, gave way in one immense sheet and forty men who were on it threw themselves some forward and some back, trampling on each other. All the time the cannonballs kept regularly whistling by and falling on the ice, into the water, and, more frequently than all, into the mass of men that covered the dike, the ponds, and the banks. End of chapter 18《パート3》《Chapter 19》of《War and Peace》by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. On the Pratzer Hill, in the same spot where he had fallen with the flagstaff in his hand, lay Prince Andrei Bolkonsky, his life blood oozing away and unconsciously groaning with light, pitiful groans, like an ailing child. By evening he ceased to groan and lay absolutely still. He did not know how long his unconsciousness continued. Suddenly he felt that he was alive and suffering from a burning and tormenting pain in his head. Where is that lofty heaven which I had never seen before and which I saw today? That was his first thought. And I never knew such pain as this either, he said to himself. Yes, I have never known anything anything at all, till now. But where am I? 
he tried to listen and heard the trampling hoofs of several horses approaching and the sounds of voices talking French. He opened his eyes. Over him still stretched the same lofty heavens with clouds sailing over it in still loftier heights, and beyond them he could see the depths of endless blue. He did not turn his head or look at those who, to judge from the hoofbeats of the horses and the sounds of the voices, rode up to him and paused. These horsemen were Napoleon, accompanied by two aides. Bonaparte, who had been riding over the field of battle, had given orders to strengthen the battery that was cannonading the dyke of Auguste, and was now looking after the killed and wounded left on the battlefield. De beaux hommes, handsome men, said Napoleon, gazing at a Russian grenadier, who lay on his belly, with his face half buried in the soil, and his neck turning black, and one arm flung out and stiffened in death. The ammunition for the field guns is exhausted, sire. Half that of the reserves brought, said Napoleon, and then a step or two nearer he paused over Prince André, who lay on his back with the flagstaff clutched in his hands. The flag had been carried off by the French as a trophy. Voilà, un bel amant, said Napoleon, gazing at Balkonsky. Prince André realized that this was said of him, and that it was spoken by Napoleon. He heard them address the speaker as, sire, but he heard these words as though they had been the buzzing of a fly. He was not only not interested in them, but they made no impression upon him, and he immediately forgot them. His head throbbed as with fire. He felt that his lifeblood was ebbing, and he still saw far above him the distant, eternal heavens. He knew that this was Napoleon, his hero, but at this moment Napoleon seemed to him merely a small, insignificant man in comparison with that lofty, infinite heaven, with the clouds flying over it. It was a matter of utter indifference to him who stood looking down upon him, or what was said about him at that moment. He was merely conscious of a feeling of joy that people had come to him, and of a desire that these people give him assistance and bring him back to life, which seemed to him so beautiful, because he understood it so differently now. He collected all his strength to move and make some sound. He managed to move his legs slightly, and uttered a weak, feeble, sickly moan that stirred pity even in himself. "'Ah, he is alive,' said Napoleon. "'Take up this young man, ce jeune homme, and take him to the temporary hospital.' Having given this order, Napoleon went on to meet Marshal Lenz, who, removing his hat and smiling, rode up and congratulated him on the victory. Prince André recollected nothing further— he lost consciousness of the terrible pain caused by those who placed him on the stretcher, and by the jolting as he was carried along, and the probing of the wound. He recovered it again only at the very end of the day, as he was carried to the hospital together with the other Russian wounded, and taken prisoner. At this time he felt a little fresher, and was able to glance around, and even to speak. The first words which he heard after he came to were spoken by a French officer in charge of the convoy, who said, "'We must stop here.' the emperor's coming by immediately. It will give him pleasure to see these prisoners. There are so many prisoners today, almost the whole Russian army. I should think it would have become an old story, said another officer. Well, at any events, this man here, they say, was the commander of all the Emperor Alexander's guards, said the first speaker, indicating a wounded Russian officer in a white cavalier guard's uniform. Volkonsky recognized Prince Repnin, whom he had met in Petersburg society. Next him was a youth of nineteen, an officer of the cavalier guard also wounded. Bonaparte, coming up at a gallop, reined in his horse. "'Who is the chief officer here?' he asked, looking at the wounded. They pointed to Colonel Prince Repnin. "'Were you the commander of the Emperor Alexander's Horse Guard Regiment?' asked Napoleon. "'I commanded a squadron,' replied Repnin. "'Your regiment did its duty with honor," remarked Napoleon." Praise from a great commander is the highest reward that a soldier can have, said Repnin. It is with pleasure that I give it to you, replied Napoleon. Who is this young man next you? Prince Repnin named Lieutenant Suchtelen. Napoleon glanced at him and said with a smile, Il est venu, bien jeune de faute et à nous, very young to oppose us. Youth does not prevent one from being brave, replied Suchtelen in a broken voice. A beautiful answer, said Napoleon. Young man, you will get on in the world. 
Prince Andre, who had been placed also in the front rank, under the eyes of the emperor, so as to swell the number of those who had been taken prisoner, naturally attracted his attention. Napoleon evidently remembered having seen him on the field, and turning to him he used exactly the same expression, young man, as when Bolkonsky had the first time come under his notice. Et vous, jeune homme? Well, and you, young man, said he, addressing him. How do you feel, mon brave? Although five minutes before this Prince André had been able to say a few words to the soldiers who were bearing him, he now fixed his eyes directly on Napoleon, but had nothing to say. To him at this moment all the interests occupying Napoleon seemed so petty, his former hero himself, with his small vanity and delight in the victory, seemed so sordid in comparison with that high, true, and just heaven which he had seen and learned to understand, and that was why he could not answer him. Yes, and everything seemed to him so profitless and insignificant in comparison with that stern and majestic train of thought induced in his mind by his lapsing strength, as his life-blood ebbed away, by his suffering and the near expectation of death. As Prince André looked into Napoleon's eyes, he thought of the insignificance of majesty, of the insignificance of life, the meaning of which no one could understand, and of the still greater insignificance of death, the thought of which no one could among men understand or explain. The emperor, without waiting for any answer, turned away, and as he started to ride on, said to one of the officers, Have these gentlemen looked after and conveyed to my bouviac. Have Dr. Larry himself looked after their wounds. Au revoir, Prince Repnin, and he touched the spurs to his horse and galloped away. His face was bright with self-satisfaction and happiness. The soldiers carrying Prince Andrei had taken from him the gold medallion which the Princess Maria had hung around her brother's neck, but when they saw the flattering way in which the emperor treated the prisoners, they hastened to return the medallion. Prince Andrei did not see how or by whom the medallion was replaced, but he suddenly discovered on his chest, outside of his uniform, the little image attached to its slender golden chain. It would be good, thought Prince Andrei. Letting his eyes rest on the medallion which his sister had hung around his neck with so much feeling and reverence, it would be good if everything were as clear and simple as it seems to the Princess Maria. How good it would be to know where to find help in this life, and what to expect after it, beyond the grave! How happy and composed I should be, if I could say now, Lord, have mercy on me! But to whom can I say that? It is force, impalpable, incomprehensible, which I cannot turn to, or even express in words. Is it the great all, or nothingness, said he to himself, or is it God which is sewed in this amulet which my sister gave me? Nothing, nothing is certain, except the insignificance of all within my comprehension, and the majesty of that which is incomprehensible, but all-important. The stretcher started off. At every jolt he again felt the insufferable pain. His fever grew more violent, and he began to be delirious. The dreams about his father, his wife, his sister, and his unborn son, and the feeling of tenderness which he had experienced on the night before the battle, the figure of the little insignificant Napoleon, and above all the lofty sky, formed the principal content of his feverish imaginations. He seemed to be living a quiet life amid calm, domestic happiness at Luisia Gouri. He was beginning to take delight in this blissful existence, when suddenly the little Napoleon appeared with his unsympathetic, shallow-minded face, expressing happiness at the unhappiness of others, and once more doubts began to arise and torment him, and only the skies seemed to promise healing balm. Toward morning all his imaginations were utterly confused and blurred in the chaos and fogs of unconsciousness and forgetfulness which much more likely, according to the opinion of Dr. Loray, Napoleon's physician, would end with death than recovery. C'est du sujeuner veri belou. Il ne échappe pas. Bas. He won't recover. Prince André, together with other prisoners hopelessly wounded, was turned over to the care of the natives of the region. End of chapter 19 End of part 3 and end of volume one of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle, and recorded by Marianne Spiegel.
in Chicago, Illinois, February 2013. Thank you to Cat Rose for proof-listening this volume.